Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the invited talks of the Activity Net workshop. I hope that you're enjoying the workshop so far. Um, in this live event, we will have three researchers from industry to talk about their recent work. Um, we will start with Christoph uh, Reinheiter. I'm sorry if I said that uh, wrong. Um, Christoph it's is fine. a research scientist at Hi. He's a research scientist at FAIR who has uh, brought significant contributions to action recognition. Uh, his recent work includes computational theories for representing spatial temporal uh, visual information. Uh, today, he will be talking about efficient video recognition. Uh, so with further ado, uh, Mike is for Christoph. Thank you for the introduction. I'm sharing my screen. Please let right, me know if you see. can see my screen. Uh, I'm okay, sorry, great. Can uh, you see the if presentation? you have any, this is for the uh, attendees. If you have any questions, if you have any questions, please uh, use the Q&A tab on the right. We will uh, uh, aggregate these questions and ask them at the end of each talk. Go ahead, Christoph. We, we, we see your slides. OK, thank you. Uh, then I'll start. So hi, everyone. Uh, I work at Facebook AI Research. I'm a research scientist. Uh, in this tutorial, I will discuss some basic and recent models for efficient video recognition. So here is a course outline of the talk. I will first talk about video representation learning, then introduce a lightweight model architecture and a new method to accelerate training of video models. Finally, I will present some recent work on audiovisual learning and then give a brief outlook. All the code for these methods is or will be available at this GitHub link shown below, Facebook research slash slowfast, which is our PyTorch code base for video understanding. So for the first part on representation learning, I talk about a model called slowfast networks. The basic idea of slow fast networks is to have a slow pathway that is capturing semantic information by operating at low frame rate and a fast pathway that captures motion information at higher frame rate. For the slow pathway, it is a spatial temporal residual network shown by the blue feature tensors here with low temporal resolution T. And the intuition is that for detection of objects or people, low frame rate should be sufficient because they don't change. The semantic information doesn't change a lot over time. In contrast, the fast pathway is designed to capture rapid motion information by operating at alpha times higher frame rate. And despite its higher temporal resolution, alpha times higher frame rate and temporal resolution, this pathway is made very lightweight because it has better times fewer feature channels. Very lightweight in the sense that it only has 20% of the overall computation, roughly. The two pathways are also fused with lateral connections between. So for example, if you would like to detect this hand clapping um, annotation in the AVA dataset shown here on the bottom, it's really required that you have high frame rate. But on the other hand, detecting semantic information like people or objects like glasses and so on, uh, low, a low frame rate is sufficient. In the paper, we evaluate slow fast networks on several tasks. So here we plot the results for the action detection class on the AVA dataset, where we plot the class level performance gain of using slow fast, now in green over its slow counterparts means slow is in blue is only a slow pathway and slow fast numbers are shown in green here. And you can see that especially for highly dynamic action classes such as dancing, running, jogging, fighting or hitting, hand clapping and so on, we can observe a substantial boost in mean average precision for using the fast pathway additionally to the slow pathway. For the action detection task, our detector is very similar to faster RCNN applied to video. The video shows here qualitative results with the detected boxes in green and the ground truth boxes in red. Our action detections are shown on the top of the person with confidence scores. 
while the ground truth labels are shown on the bottom. The video really illustrates uh, the difficulty of this task as actions have to be localized in both space and time. In comparison to previous work, uh, the slow fast model achieves significant gain in detection accuracy. Last year, we also participated in the ActivityNet challenge for the AVA task, and we saw a 13 MAP gain over the winning approach from the previous year. Moreover, um, in 2019, also the top three ranked teams used slow fast models as, as their backbone. Now, some recent results from this year's challenge also indicate that slow fast was heavily used in the winning approaches on the AVA kinetics uh, data set, which is a new data set, uh, and the challenge held this year. And also on the kinetics 700 uh, classification challenge, um, I've seen that slow fast models were used in the winning approaches. So this really underlines that our method is very, or the slow fast model is very general and well received by the community. Next, I want to highlight that video model training is actually very expensive compared to image training. So for example, this Kinetic 700 data set um, mentioned on the previous slide has around 200 million frames, if you count the number of frames in the data set, which is around 160 times the number of images we have in ImageNet, which is significantly more. So if we look at the difference here in this plot of training duration for a ResNet 50 model on ImageNet, versus a 3D version of this ResNet 50 model on Kinetics 400, which is the smaller Kinetics, we see that for one GPU, it takes around 14 times longer to train a model there. But this has also reasons because the models are very expensive in video compared to image models, and also the training is less efficient. And next, I want to look at two approaches that can increase efficiency. So first, I talk about how to increase efficiency on the modeling side. And as motivation for 2D tasks such as image or object recognition, it is very common to ap apply 2D filters of input Im to input images, uh, which results in feature tensors of size H times W times C for the height, width, and number of channels of these tensors. For video recognition, a very intuitive way is to convolve an input video clip with 3D spatiotemporal filters. So this is typically done by extending an image-based network by a third dimension. Basically, nearly all the video classification backbones are temporal extensions of ImageNet design. And what this means is that the HWC dimensions of the feature uh, activations and tensors, they are fixed and inherited from the ImageNet design. The claim in this work, X3D, is that the direct temporal extension of image architectures for video is uh, suboptimal for efficient video recognition. So I, our idea is that it's called X3D, and this is an architecture that is expanded from a tiny image model across multiple axes for good accuracy to computation trade-off. On the right, I show an, a table of this model. Um, and it's called X2D, which is the model that starts the expansion. Um, and here you can see it has tiny resolution at the input. For example, if you can see my mouse, it has 112 uh, resolution in the spatial size. It has just one frame in the temporal dimension here. And the colorized gamma variables you can see in these tables here, um, they're factors used to expand the small model which is initialized, the gammas are all initialized to one. And the candidate axes are frame rate, then um, the temporal duration of the input and also all feature tensors, the spatial resolution of the input and all feature tensors, network depth, then the width of the model, of all layers of the model globally the bottleneck width of the center convolution. So importantly, the center convolution of these residual blocks are channel-wise convolutions, or sometimes also referred in the literature as depth-wise separable convolutions. And these are commonly used in mobile networks, like mobile nets for image classification, and they have a very favorable floating point and parameter trade-off, and are also used in this model for the three by three by three center convolution in the residual stage. 
to generate X3D, uh, which is expanded across multiple across these multiple six axes for good computation accuracy trade-off. Uh, there are six expansion operations. Each of them expands one of these axes, one of these gamma parameters. Um, and as you can see on the right. So the expansion is done as following. So it's progressively increasing the computation of the model by 2x, for example, um, by expanding just one single of the axis at a time. Then it trains and validates the resultant architecture and selects the axis that achieves the best computation accuracy trade-off among the six different expansions. This process is repeated until the architecture reaches a desired computational budget. So when looking at this um, expansion in the experiments, uh, the expansion starts with this X2D model, which is this tiny image model with the small um, resolutions and a single frame, and then expands it um, across different dimensions. In the experiments, it starts with the bottleneck width, then it increases the frame rate, spatial resolution, duration, the depth of the model, and finally also the global width of the channels are all layers. The output of our expansion are a sequence of models from extra small to extra large capacity. And as we exponentially increase the model complexity in each step, um, this grows exponentially. The plot shows vertically the classification accuracy and horizontally the model capacity in floating point operations. And interestingly to see here, only in the last step, it increases the width of the model, which shows that the channel dimension can be much smaller than for the ImageNet counterparts, which is also um, key for the fast pathway in the slow fast model. All right, so next here we compare to previous work. The graph shows slow fast models in green, channel separated networks in pink, and temporal shift module in gray. These are state of the art models um, from ICCV uh, 2019. And the number of clips used is varied for the slow fast model here for testing, which is shown in the individual points. Comparing to these works, we see that when plotting the X3D curve, um, that X3D can reduce the number of floating point operations by up to 10x for large and small models. Concretely, comparing to the state-of-the-art CSN channel separated networks, um, X3D can provide a 5x reduction in floating point operations and parameters. And here I want to note that X3D has this advantage of using this channel-wise or depth-wise separable convolutions, as well as CSN or channel separated networks which makes a direct floating point and parameter comparison to just slow fast, um, not 100% fair. The paper has further experiments uh, against uh, for charades and AVA datasets. Please have a look at the paper for more details. All right, so next I want to talk about an efficient method or a method to efficiently train video models called MasterGrid. And for motivation, um, I show here that in video modeling, we typically also have to deal with um, very large memory consumption because we use these large feature tensors of size THWC. Um, the batch sizes we can use are typically very small. So in the extreme case, if we use 128 frames in your clip size, then you fill 12 gigabyte of memory with a batch size of just one. And however, as GPUs inherently benefit from large batch sizes, this um, can slow down training by a lot. And the, the main idea of this multigrid method is that one way to increase the training speed would be to use a smaller input resolution, but a larger batch size. But this would result in faster training, but in a more inaccurate model. Another way would be to, on the other extreme, get a more accurate model by using large input clips of large resolution, but then of course training is slower and batch size is small. Now the idea of multigrid is that we increase this batch size in a cyclic manner, reducing the spatial, res spatial temporal resolution at the input. And in the paper we have these long cycles that span several training iterations shown in this plot here of lower input resolution. So it starts with a four times lower resolution in the spatial and in the temporal domain. And that allows you to use eight times more uh, in the batch dimension. So eight times higher batch size. 
and then it progressively increases the input resolution during training. So for this concrete example, um, this would allow us to use 3.75 more training samples per iteration for the same computational budget as in standard training where you have a fixed input shape and batch shape. So this is the main idea. We vary the input resolution and increase the batch size uh, during training. And uh, this main idea um, is called multigrid, and it allows us to decrease the training duration for training standard video models, such as the slow fast model curve shown in blue here by up to 4.5x. Um, and even providing slightly higher accuracy as here, it provides 76% um, classification accuracy versus the 75% of the baseline. And we think this is because of this multi -scale, extra multi-scale training, it gets more regularization during training. All right, so uh, now I want to talk a bit about multimodal learning um, and the recent work on audiovisual slow fast networks. So this recent work um, exploits the idea that naturally video comes with both visual and audio information, and it's very intuitive to process these modalities jointly. And this has typically not been done in previous work where it's treated very differently or the, the modalities are processed by individual networks. So this motivated us for the following work. Uh, the objective of, of this paper is to build an architecture for integrated audiovisual perception and going beyond previous work that performs late fusion. So we propose audiovisual networks, uh, audiovisual slow fast networks that extend slow fast with an audio pathway that is deeply integrated with its visual counterparts by fusing at multiple layers in the network hierarchy. However, uh, one point, if, if someone tries naive joint training of audio and visual networks, it will not work and provide even lower performance than the performance of the visual network alone. So this can be explained if we observe the training dynamics and the learning curves shown on the left plot here. We see that the audio model on its own in red needs much fewer iterations to converge and then starts to even overfit at this short duration um, as shown in the validation curve in the solid line here. On the other hand, the visual counterpart, the green curve, takes much longer to converge. So to overcome this, this different learning dynamics problem, we propose to use a drop pathway um, um, method that randomly drops the audio pathway during training with a relatively high probability of like 80%. And this enables us to jointly train these models uh, with hierarchical fusion connections between modalities. In the experiments, we apply uh, this audiovisual backbone for multiple tasks, like around, I think, six data sets. We achieve um, some performance gain uh, on a variety of tasks. Sometimes the gain is smaller, sometimes it is larger, depending on how much audio can contribute to the task. Uh, this morning, I also saw that in the Kinetic 700 Challenge, a uh, winning team used the audio pathway um, from the paper or a similar pathway. So it's very pleasing to see that it's already used in, in the community and we hope to release the code for this model uh, in the following days. Finally, I also show an application of this model for self-supervised learning, which is a very popular uh, task and application these days. So another contribution in the paper we have is that we um, use audiovisual synchronization to encourage the network to produce uh, features that are generalizable across modalities. So this is inspired by some studi studies on audiovisual mirror neurons in the cortex. But what we do is very simple. Specifically, we add an auxiliary task to classify whether a pair of audio and visual frames are in sync or not. And this has been used before as self-supervised pre-training. And we use it in a semi-supervised uh, way in the paper to uh, get better features for the supervised task but also use it as a simple self-supervised way of evaluating this model. So in our self-supervised experiments, um, we show the, the performance here. Uh, what we do is we pre-train the model using an off-the-shelf pre-text task of this audiovisual synchronization. And 
Here we just compare it to some previous work and show that it performs state-of-the-art um, compared to some state-of-the-art self-supervised methods. So this further demonstrates the usefulness of the backbone itself for generality and different tasks for video understand. Finally, I would like to highlight our um, code base again and the implementation of these methods, uh, which is in PySlowFast. And this is done together with my coworkers at Facebook, led by Hao Chi Fan. Uh, it has and will have all reference implementations for the works I just discussed. And here, what we show is also that this has been very widely adopted by, by the community. We show here the GitHub stars in red graph that it's it's been um, more and more over the after it has been released last year. So to conclude, um, here I, I want to list three points for moving forward video recognition. Uh, first, I think video recognition research is still um, significantly slower than image recognition tasks. And advancing such um, video recognition for accelerating video modeling will need innovative models such as X3D, Slowfast, and so on, and also um, new and innovative training methodologies like the multigrid idea. Second, I think the world is multimodal and video captures this richness. I think our um, audiovisual Slowfast work um, is a first small step into this promising direction. And as a third point, um, uh, while this goes without saying, the future will be unsupervised. Um, there is a lot of new research coming in the self-supervised domain right now. And I think video is really the medium that allows us to learn from spatiotemporal associations across modalities, predict the future from the past, and even higher level reasoning um, that take, for example, causality into account. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions during the Q&A. Thank you, Krzysztof. Um, we have some time for a couple of questions. I'll go over uh, questions and QA. Um, if you find a question that you like, you can hit a like, and I'll just proceed from the most liked one, liked ones. Um, right. So we have a question here. Um, QA asks, what is what if you just use a very small learning rate for audio training instead of dropping it sometime? This is in reference to the uh, audio visual uh, slow and fast. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's a yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, so we tried that um, to use different learning rates for the um, audio pathway and the visual pathways, um, and it turns out it still um, led to the similar um, overfitting to the audio information. That's especially tricky. I think it might be easier to do if you don't fuse at multiple layers in your network hierarchy. But in our case, we have several fusion connections. So the audio information can basically drop into or, or drip into the, the visual um, part of the modeling. And that means even the visual backbones or the visual pathways, they can overfit to the audio information. And the audio information itself provides just a more global information. So you can think about it. The video training is typically done in small clips. So a video is seen many times during training, one single training video. But the audio information can be very correlated, much more maybe than the visual information. And then if a video has seen the audio clip or the an audio subset from, uh, if the training procedure has seen an audio subset previously in training, it will be Sometimes easy for the for the um, training procedure to just recognize the audio information and overfit to this uh, information. So we found that just dropping the audio information altogether worked best to converge these models without overfitting. Awesome. Um, uh, we have another question from Mofigo. Um, they ask, what are the best approaches to sample frames? from the video during the training and especially testing time. Yeah, right. Um, during training. My, um, my, my, my being reference to your uh, sampling rate 
in the XD, uh, X3D. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so during training, um, the idea is to sample small clips. Um, the main reason is that you cannot fit large um, batches into the, or large um, temporal clips into the GPU memory. Um, so the idea is to sample small clips and then keep training. This also allows you to, to exploit this extra regularization of the temporal chittering, um, which is quite important. So because if you try or if we try to train, you can also think about training a model that has few frames, but very large temporal strides. Then it would see like a large window uh, in time in each training iteration. And it turns out that this also doesn't work very well. It also leads to uh, quite strong overfitting because if you allow the network to see a long temporal span, it can it can remember things much easier in individual training iterations and then produce a low loss in, in consecutive iterations where it sees different parts of this video. So that's why I think small um, temporal clip sizes or windows during training are, are quite important to allow it to really exploit the full training um, training signals or training videos during training. During testing, it's a different story because actually you could, um, you don't have the burden of the backward pass and which means you don't need so much memory for testing and you can actually also throw away individual layer activations after you propagated them forward, which means in testing, you don't have a memory constraint. I think the right way, we, we currently follow a multi multi-view testing scenarios and, and that's mostly because it's, it has been done in previous work, but I think moving forward in testing the right way is fully convolutional inference. So you could actually just test the video in one shot, a long video in one shot by, by just throwing away the activations in the forward pass after you've seen them, after you've computed them. So there is no memory um, limitation in testing. And fully convolutional testing I think is good. Yep, um, we have a lot more questions. I encourage the participants to go ahead if it's a quick one. We're a bit over time. What is the what is the number at the end? What is the number of frames that you are processing in the X in the X three D? The number of frames, yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a that, yeah that's a very interesting question because I mean the the. The, the point is like, is it like a lot of frames like the fast pathway or is it just a few frames like the slow pathway or what is better? And it turns out like the um, the final models in X3D, they are something in between the slow and fast pathway. So they have 16 frames, which means um, more than the slow pathway, which can have four frames and less than the fast pathway, which has 32 frames. So it's somewhere in between the slow and fast pathways. Interesting. All right, uh, we thank Christoph uh, for his talk. Uh, if you guys have thank more you. questions, I encourage you to reach out to Christoph uh, through email or any other means. Um, up next, we have uh, Victor Scorsia. Uh, Victor is a research scientist at Samsung. Um, he uh, worked on a lot of things uh, related to uh, spatial temporal localization, uh, proposals, um, he, uh, in his words, uh, he spent uh, his days figuring out ways to uh, compute and preserve and reason about the world, uh, making cu computers uh, perceive and reason about the world as humans do. Uh, his current research focuses on developing scalable and efficient video understanding. Uh, Victor will share uh, with us today his work towards efficient and uh, expressive video understanding. Uh, take it away, Victor. Okay, can you hear me, guys? Yes. And uh, the, some of the participants had an issue with the slides. If you have any issue with the slides, please refresh your browser or rejoin the, uh, the meeting again. Um, go ahead, Victor. Okay, cool. So thanks, Suman, for the introduction and to everybody for attending this, especially those joining from Europe or even in far, uh, farther east. 
So today I will discuss with you, I mean, like the approach that we are at Samsung Research, in particular the AI Center in Cambridge, very interested with respect to video understanding, and those are efficient and expressive models. So as we all know, like for example, in, in this workshop, like we are interested, I mean, like the, the visual universe in videos is quite diverse. However, in Samsung, we have like a particular interest on like develop new technology to improve the well-being. And um, for example, we can imagine that improving the well-being could be like uh, making the people like, for example, enjoy the moments of the, our pets when we are not at home, or like, for example, taking away from us like a tedious task, for example, opening the, opening the door to a couple of friends while well, we cannot, yeah? Uh, so there are a lot of applications in the understanding, but I will leave it, uh, I will leave it there as, due to the time. So in today's talk, I will discuss with you, uh, in particularly, like two efficient architectures for action recognition, one that, is, one that aims fully at efficiency, another one that is that, that tries to be like more, an, to build more like an expressive model to understand what the model is paying attention to. And finally, I will, I will conclude with like the, I mean, the yeah, the last work of my PhD that is beyond action recognition and focusing on new tasks and models uh, where we can really see that, for example, the understanding beyond a single label. Yeah. So without further ado, let me tell you about uh, about CrossNet, which is an efficient action recognition, and this is joint work with my colleagues at, uh, at Samsung. Yeah. So just to give you a broad context, and this is a slide borrowed from a an ongoing tutorial this day in CVPR. So there has been like a plurality of architectures uh, for analyzing videos, right? So Christos was mentioning uh, in the previous talk about slow pass, which is like, which has uh, attracted a lot of the attention in the community recently. Also last year, we can, I mean, like we also observed like, for example, this model called DSM, which is a 2D backbone, um, processing like less amount of frames than slow pass and achieving similar performance. So this kind of lightweight model is the ones that we are kind of interested at Samsung. And why is that? Well, I mean, in mind that we, I mean, we are trying to do real time action recognition of human daily activities, for example, filling in a kettle. So in some cases, like for example, good, I mean, like state of the art models as slow fast, like for example, in certain applications, can give you like the right answer, not in this particular case, I mean, we, that I have picked, but for example, it can give you the answer really, really slow. So what we would like is to have like these kind of uh, predictions in real time. And this is what we are aiming here at Samsung such that we can unleash all the kind of applications that we, that we would like to bring to the homes and to uh, the environments where people uh, spend their time. So what is CrossNet? CrossNet. So CrossNet, like it's a new. I mean, we introduce a new block such that we can efficiently and precisely model the temporal information. So at the heart of of CrossNet is this TCR uh, TCR block. And uh, let me tell you like what this TCR block does into detail. So first of all, the TCR block. Uh, it will split the channel, so that's why we that we can observe these two strings. So we will split the information that the that the network is learning. So in one, I mean, like on the on the upper stream, that upper stream can model like a full temporal resolution, and in the lower stream, that one will have like a lower temporal resolution. Now, in contrast, in contrast with slow path we are splitting the information that the network is learning. Therefore, we introduce these cross-stream uh, cross interactions such that one, I mean, like the information that the network learns in one stream can help the other one and, uh, and vice versa. Now, as you can see, we are introducing this, uh, we are splitting the channels by, uh, by this factor alpha. So therefore, we have like a, a tunable, a new node, a new node that we can tune according to the application. Uh, for as we believe that, for example, not all the applications like demand the same amount of accuracy. So maybe, I mean, maybe some of uh, some demands more efficiency rather than accuracy. Yeah. So now 
that's the TCR block. Now, how do we put that block into the network? So basically, like here in this figure, I'm trying to recreate, like for example, the standard uh, ResNet pipeline where we have multiple stages. And what we do is that we replace the bottleneck, uh, the bottleneck block in a ResNet module by this TCR, uh, by this TCR module that we that I presented before. And in that way, we can improve, like, I mean, like, we can tune the efficiency and trade and trade efficiency and computation of a given backbone. Let me emphasize you, uh, let me emphasize that, I mean, like, although this figure, re I mean, resembles the uh, ResNet, I mean, we have done this, like, with more efficient backbones, such as mobile net, mobile net uh, version two, which, like, for example, exploit the concept of, uh, Separable, separable convolutions. Yeah. Now, one little detail of the training, uh, training of these crossing architectures that I want to mention with you, like in here, I'm like, uh, from, I mean, from the most part, the training is mostly similar. However, what we found out is that given that we are splitting the chat the information that the network is learning, given that we are splitting the channel, uh, and we are splitting based on channels. So we need to introduce this feature reconstruction loss term such that the network can recover, like can fully recover the, the whole performance. So the cross, I mean, what we observe is that the cross stream interactions, although useful, they, they can, they doesn't, they don't allow us to recover the full information due to the, due to the design of splitting the channels. Uh, so now let me tell you a bit about the results of our crossnet architecture, in particularly in the something something D1 dataset. We, we extensively explore more datasets, of course, but in the interest of time, I will focus on this. So as we, as you can observe here, like for, uh, our crossnet using, for example, backbones, uh, efficient bas uh, backbones such as uh, ResNet 50, it's able to improve the performance uh, with respect to the baseline, and the baseline in this case will be the blue dots referring to TSM. So in, in the something something D1 dataset, we are able to improve the performance, and also as you can as you can notice, like we are able to to reduce the uh, re, sorry, yeah reduce the number of flows, uh, given that we are moving towards the left. Yeah. Let me zoom in in this particular region that we have here. And in this region, we can observe like what happened when you introduce like, for example, more efficient backbones such as mobile net. So with more, I mean like with mobile net, we are able, uh, similar with our, with the baseline of TSM, we are able to cut the, uh, cut the number of flows by 50%. While my, I mean like what is slightly improving the accuracy of our model. So in this case, like we have a win and win for, for from both sides of the network, and this is like uh, one of the reasons of this is due to the particular design choice that that we have uh, made in our architect and the training details that I mentioned. Uh, now let me uh, take a step further towards, like for example, more expressive models uh, for not only efficient, but also expressive. And by expressive, let me tell you what I mean by that. In particularly, we are, in, we are interested in like, what are the parts of the input that the network is focusing on? So let me let me use this example to, to ground what I'm trying to say here. So for example, in a data set such as something, something, uh, you have like really fine grain classes. For example, you can have putting something next to something or putting something on the surface. So here, like for example, if you don't know the, I mean, with these fine grain labels, you could have labeled that this person like put something, uh, something on the surface. And this is what kind of what we try to, uh, why we try to understand, I mean, like pay attention to what is the network, uh, what are the parts of the input that the network is focusing on. So what we would like is that, for example, for the label, there is certain consistency. Like for example, when you're putting something next to something, well, you need to know, I mean, you need to pay attention to also to, to two things, not only a single one. Yeah. And that's what like our, our module W3, uh, which I will explain for uh, in a few seconds, will try to do. In particular, uh, our W3, uh, our W3 is an attention module. 
uh, and is one that is basically, uh, basically is a factorization of a video attention. So what we are trying to do here is like, I mean, here I'm presenting two kinds of attentions that we use, uh, that we use. And one is like, for example, channel temporal attention. Um, basically in this channel temporal attention, we try to, I mean, we try to model along the time dimension, what are the channels uh, paying attention to? Yeah, so what is, I mean, each of these channels, for example, represents the information, the intermediate representation of the network. Therefore, we would like to, like, for example, put a, part, uh, uh, a particular branch of the network that models the temporal relations, uh, the temporal uh, information there. Similarly, we can do also for the spatial, uh, spatial temporal side. So basically, we need in that, in that particular attention, we somehow neglect the channels and we focus mainly like on the, only on the, in the video spatial uh, information of the network. Yeah. Similar to the crossnet, this is a new, blo I mean, this is basically a new model that you can insert in, in your, in your architecture, um, in your, in your bottleneck connections. Um, the only difference here is that we will have this transversal path that takes into account like the attention and bring it all the way to, all the way almost to the, the layer just before the output. Um, basically, I mean, without going too much into detail, this is what we found that it's useful for uh, for getting like a better representation during training and to improve uh, to improve the flow of the of the gradients during the back propagation. So, what are the results of this particular architecture uh, W3? So, as you can see here, like for example, we are comparing to I mean, like for a, for a, uh, for a, an architecture such as PSM, we are comparing versus different kind of attentions, C band, non local networks. And our W3, and we do, and uh, what we observe is that W3 allow us to give us, uh, the best jump in terms of accuracy. And again, this is something, something we want, but we have more results in the, in the archive if, if you want to take a look at those. Now, as I was, I mean, as I was saying before, like this, this proving the network, we are interested in paying, I mean, like trying to understand what the network is paying attention to, but we don't want to sacrifice efficiency. So in terms of efficiency, let me tell you, like, for example, uh, as you can see, for example, C band versus W3, the, the improvement in terms of the increase of um, amount of blocks, it's almost negligible. So there is like a, a one, uh, one gigahertz blocks of difference. However, like, given the jump in accuracy, we feel that it's a, a good trade off. And like, as I was motivating before, the attentions now, like it, it, it makes makes a lot of, I mean, like makes sense in some in some of the cases that we have explored. Uh, another alternative, as I was mentioning, is non-local networks. However, like uh, with non-local networks, we we notice that the improvements in terms of gigaflops it's way way higher, like more than seventy percent. Okay. So let me tell you that this was uh, W3 was one, uh, a part of our secret sauce in order to secure the third place in the Epic Kitchen Challenge uh, that we participate in this year. Uh, so I mean, like, if you want to know more details about it, please uh, visit, uh, take a look at the technical report that we submit for that challenge. Now, in the rest of the time that I have, uh, I will tell you about this, I mean, like this project about finding moments in video collections. So this is really trying to stretch, uh, to stretch and put the boundary of video understanding beyond action classification. And by that, I, uh, I, I mean in particular, like, for example, not only, for example, new downstream tasks such as localization or retrieval, but also like, for example, to understand, uh, the content of the video in a more in a in a more expressive way. So for that end, let's let's define this new task. We define a new task in which as input we have like for example a text query, the girl jumps up and down. And the I mean and now we are not only interested in a single video but in a collection of videos. And we would I mean what we would like to do is that the, our algorithm goes and retrieve only the only the only the videos that are associated to that particular text query, but 
but instead of like retrieving only the video, we would like also to put a temporal uh, temporal boundary where we can find the particular text query in that in, in a given video. So, like for example, in this case, like uh, our model would retrieve these three three different videos, and we can clearly see that like in two of them, like there is a girl jumping up and down. So as just to summarize, like this new task is about joint retrieval because we need to pull out videos of interest out of a video corpus, but also temporal localization. So we are interested in these two, in these two tasks and to do them jointly. Now for this, for this new particular task, what we, what we, are, what we believe is that we need a model that aligns part. I'm like that in order to perform well, it needs to align parts of the query, like for example, uh, uh, nouns and verbs, into regions of the video. Yeah, and by that, and in particular, we are in particular interested in selecting spatial temporal regions out of out of the video that try to maximize the alignment between a given moment uh, depicted in yellow and the text query. Now. The architecture that we are that we are interested on, uh, we will formulate it in this way: that is a function that, given a video and a, and a and a particular moment, it consumes the video in the with a visual stream branch, which is this blue and blue and purple one, and embeds all the information of that video into a common space. And in that common space, we will also embed the information from the text query. So based on this. Uh, on the information in this common space of visual, uh, visual and language information, we will do the retrieval and the align and, and, and the alignment or selection of a given moment. Yeah. So just, just I mean, I, there is just one comment that I want to highlight here, and that is that the function that we are interested uh, to learn should be amenable for indexing, given that we need to pull out videos from a database, from, from multiple videos. So we cannot, like, for example, be really naive of, like, for example, doing a forward pass or for each given query and texting our, and viewing our database to do a forward pass through all of them every time that we want to search for something of interest. Yeah. So in the interest of time, let me tell you that, I mean, like, as I was saying before, like this network tried to give a moment, which I, which I am highlighting here in yellow. This, ne uh, this network trying to align, like for example, uh, regions, uh, spatial temporal regions, such as those in magenta, and clips, like particular clips composed in this moment. And basically, what I mean, in order to align with a given text query, what we do is, like for example, we exploit this spatial temporal alignment cost, which we formulated in, a, in an efficient manner as a chamfer loss, basically like a point. Uh, point to point distance, uh, point to point uh, set uh, comparison between two sets, the sets of uh, words in the text query and the sets of information in terms of objects, uh, spatial temporal regions from the view. Yeah. Uh, now, let me just emphasize what is the, uh, the importance of the of uh, designing a function amenable for indexing is that, for example, at test time you can do like an scalable retrieval system. So you you get a query, for example, the baby first smile, and in your be in in your database, the only thing that you will embed there is like for example the clips. So basically, you will trim all your videos into sh into short clips of let's say five seconds, and every time that a new clip arrives, you go and retrieve I mean like the most similar clips for that particular text query. Now over those clips that you retrieve, you will apply like for example. Uh, the the alignment the alignment function that I just described in the slide in the slide before and this will be the like for example uh, this would be the the outputs that we expect from our model yeah so again trying to re, uh, resemble the text query and in that way to be expressed I mean like to have an expressive model yeah. so just to emphasize basically what we are doing is like searching for candidate moments. I mean, like in the data sets that we tried out, these are more than 20k moments uh, of, vari of variable length. And the corpus of these, in this case, in the data sets that we tried, was like, for example, around 1,000 bits. And these are like, this is one of the qualitative examples. The text query is here. The person is eating a sandwich. 
And again, like for example, what we pull out the video and also the, the particular temporal interval that you have, that you see highlighted here where the act, where the text query most likely is happening. So in this case, like for example, this, this year was pretending in the sense. So we, we can see that the system is performing well. Similar here, like again, like uh, the, the comment to mention, to highlight here is that we are pulling out different, I mean, different videos or like different, or different parts of the same video in case the action happens in multiple locations. So let me just briefly tell you about the results you, such that we can uh, keep with the schedule uh, of the challenge. So as you can see here, for example, we observe that our model is more eff effective than the existing alternative that we spent for this particular task. And uh, like, for example, in this particular, these particular two models, we show like, for example, using uh, the moment information, it's more, in, uh, it's beneficial with respect to doing like something like only, only using text information and after that applying like single video moment retrieval algorithm. Similarly, like our algorithm, uh, our model style, uh, give the best, uh, better, uh, better improvements over the previous phase. Now, one thing of interest that I would like to highlight here is that although the data sets that we tried out only have like uh, videos in the order of one, uh, 1,000, less than, less than 20K videos, uh, we simulate a scenario with 1 billion videos and we observe that the efficiency of our method uh, it's it's much much uh, it's much better than the previous than the existing alternative. So our model is not only e effective but also efficient for this particular task. So uh, the conclusion that I would like to tell you here is that well, I mean, like today I have shown to you like a new building block PCR, which allows you to like for example take an architecture and try to play with the uh, accuracy in the trade-off between accuracy and computation. Uh, we have also seen like an, I mean, like an efficient way to have an expressive model uh, without sacrificing performance and also a new task and a new model where we can really go beyond simple action classification and start to uh, pay attention to other I mean, like to, to the videos in a more rich manner. So, That's that's all that I have from my side. So yes. Thank you, thank you, Victor. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions. Um, Gordon asks: uh, the net is currently split into two in the cross net. Can it be split in more than two branches? And how do you think it would perform in terms of accuracy and latency? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a, that's an interesting an, an interesting uh, question and observation actually. So we, I mean, like yeah, like for example, like he's, he's talking about crossnet. So we were splitting yes. information a, a lot of the channels. Uh, for example, alpha channels with full temporal resolution and one minus alpha for uh, less temporal resolution. Yeah, yeah, and I think that it might be possible. Is you, I mean, like we only tried out with this. Uh, with these two channels, uh, given that, I mean, for simplicity. Yeah, so like, for example, given that, like, for example, in one channel, and like in the, in the, in the full temporal channel, like you are only using alpha times C, like it was like straightforward to estimate, like, for example, how much efficient, I mean, like how much uh, efficiency you are saving uh, with this particular design. Uh, probably like, yeah, I don't know, like using like probably something more elaborate, like for example, a neural architecture search and try to go beyond these two, I mean, like splitting on two streams and try multiple and might make sense. And the other thing that I would like to add here is that uh, the temporal resolution of the models that we tried out is at most 16 frames. So that's why we also didn't go like beyond, like for example, uh, with too many branches. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question about CrossNet. Uh, Juan Carlos asks, uh, do you have any visualization to see what the network learns with the something something data set? I wonder if there are any intuitions there and about how the network captures temporal relations. 
Yeah, uh, for the cross net we didn't, I mean, we didn't, uh, that's a good question and uh, something that we we must do. <laughs> Thanks for pointing out. So I think that for cross net we, we didn't do that kind of proving, uh, given that the main, I mean, the, the main target of with cross net was really like improve efficiency as much as possible such that we could deploy uh, later on mobile, which is, I mean, basically what we would like. I mean, the interest of Samsung, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one last quick question uh, from Mofjil. Um, he asked about the moment works. How do you handle the frame sample right there? The frame sample, right? Yeah. So for for this for this work of moment, basically we did we did I mean we did something that is like simple get efficiency. I mean we didn't really want to complicate the things and keep the Keep the comparison simple, like for example, with previous work, like with in single video moment retrieval with MCM. So basically, what we did is that uh, we split the video. A video could, uh, can be really long, right, and can be on print. So that video <coughs> we split, like, pro, uh, we split it like in non-overlapping chunk clips so of three at most five seconds. Yeah. So um, based on those, based on those clips, those are the ones that we add to our database. So we didn't really play with the with the sampling. I mean, with the sampling frame. I mean, with the with the yeah, with the frame samples there. We split the basically we did, we did something really uniform. Split the video uniformly, um, and I mean, that's all those post all those clips into the database. That's what the model is doing. Awesome. Uh, very interesting work, Victor. Thank you so much again. Thanks. Uh, all right, uh, we'll move on to our last speaker. Um, our last speaker is Fabian Caba. Uh, he's a research scientist at Adobe Research, uh, who is on a quest to deconstruct storytelling. His previous works has uh, focused on modeling action localization, but nowadays his research focuses on understanding videos via story-aware representation. Uh, today, his talk will be uh, titled, Who Said What and When? So thank you, Human. Thank you, Human. And I just want to do a sound check. Can you hear me well? Yes. And can you see my slides? Yep. Okay, awesome. So yeah, thank you, Human, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining and sticking around uh, in the workshop. And today I'm going to talk about who say what and when. So this is actually an effort on understanding video stories from a speech retrieval perspective. So let's start motivating this talk by analyzing this scene. So we have frames from a scene, and computer vision system can nowadays understand many, many things in that scene. For instance, like you have two persons sitting in a coach. Um, uh, those persons actually are probably having a conversation. And at the end of the scene, they actually hang, uh, shake hands. So computer vision system can do a lot. But can they really understand what's happening behind the scene? Can they understand what is the story behind that scene and that sequence? So my arguing this talk is actually to understand fully the scene. You actually need to understand the dialogue and the conversation that these people are having. Um, and to do that, uh, and to truly understand, not only you need to understand the scene um, and what actions are happening and what is the dialogue that they are having, but also who this person are. So if we know that we're talking about President Obama and um, President Trump before he uh, gets into the house, we know what this meeting could be about. So this is actually a meeting before actually uh, President Trump uh, got elected. And they were discussing several topics about how the transition will be between the two uh, presidencies. So yeah, I just wanna make a point here that actually to truly understand the scene happening in there, to truly understand the story, we need to go beyond only visual information. We need to start understanding the dialogue. And we know that uh, from the speech community, we have very good technology for doing a speech to text. So indeed, uh, several companies have services available that almost everybody can use and extract this information from videos. But there is still one missing point in there. So who spoke when? And I argue in here that actually using a, a visual perspective can help a tremendous efforts on the audio 
uh, domain that can happen in recent years. So uh, to, to summarize my motivation here, so we have very good technologies for transcribing videos, but now we need to uh, develop technologies that uh, understand who spoke when. And with who I mean like which person says something at any given time and actually associate associate all what that person says in a collection of videos. This uh, smart speech uh, retrieval and search technology can enable many, many, many applications ranging from a smart search in archival footage, doing a, a semantic transcript based video editing and, to, uh, and actually understanding a storytelling in films. So today I'm going to talk about two technologies that we have been working on that tackle two aspects uh, on who spoke when. And actually these technologies can help to develop this speaker realization technology. Before I get into the details, I just want to uh, mention all my collaborators in these two projects. And especially I want to mention Juan Carlos, who has been the leading force in these projects. So let's start with the active speaker detection approach. Um, first of all, let's define the problem. What is active speaker detection? So let's assume we have a frame in a video. Uh, we have multiple people appearing in that video. The task of active speaker detection is actually identifying who of them is talking at any given time. So in this example, we see these three nice faces in there. Uh, the green box actually represents who is speaking at, at the frame that we sample for this uh, slide. Um, uh, recently, uh, uh, Rod et al. introduced the AVA Active Speaker Dataset, which contains a uh, dense annotations of active speaker detections in movies videos. But what is the motivation of this work and what is our key idea here? So previous approaches have focused on understanding active speaker detection from a local point of view. So basically, they only analyze a single phase at a very short period of time. So basically they are seeing a totally blurred scene and they are not having enough context to understand who the speaker is. So our, propose, our proposal in this work is actually leveraged that context. So we know that there are patterns in conversations and we know that information from other uh, potential speakers can help to deambiguate many of the confusing cases and the hard cases. In this example, for instance, we can see that the speaker highlighted in green actually is listening to the speaker in red. And this speaker in green actually has the lips closed all this time. So using this information can truly help the model to the ambiguate a small uh, inconsistencies when you analyze local information. So how do we model this? So I'm not gonna jump into the details of this. So if you wanna learn more about this, please join us at our poster during this CVPR. But I'm gonna highlight a, I'm going to provide a quick overview, a high level overview of the pipeline that we have developed. So basically we are using a short term encoder that actually a, encodes a visual and audio information at a short term level. So basically it takes about half a second of a clip and actually half a second of an audio. This passing through this yellow block that we see in there. And then we concatenate information in long periods of time. So we not only extract this information for a single clip, but we do it for many clips from many phases in a long period of time. So we stack all this together into a huge context tensor. And now our task is actually learn relationships between, uh, between those embeddings that we have extracted from there. So to do that, we use self-attention that actually learn pairwise relationships across those phases and audio information. And finally, I mean, we haven't modeled yet the time information yet, so we pass this into a sequence to sequence LSTM that can actually model temporal relationships across the speakers and across all the phases in a given window. Once we have this enriched representation, we can now finally predict who the active speaker is at any given time in the video. So how well it performs, so I'm good. Before jumping into the state of the art, I want to do a diagnosis here and an relation here. So our main motivation and our key idea is actually using context. But does con context really, really help? So in the left, we have a table that uh, shows that it actually helps and a lot. 
So we have analyzed two components in the context. So we have how much the temporal information helps, and that's what we see over the rows. So we see what happens if we see only one clip, and then we see the performance uh, actually increasing when we have larger, long, when we have longer and longer context. As well, when we move into the number of speakers that we encode, uh, that's uh, the variable s, and basically that's changing from column to column. We see that encoding the most speakers we can in any uh, temporal processing window, we improve the performance as well. So basically, this uh, this actually shows that longer and exhaustive, exhaustive context is key for active speaker detection. And this is similar this is similar actual, actually to many findings in action recognition, where we have seen as well that contents or analyze and or analyzing long term context help for action recognition as well. But where this improvement is coming from. So what is really interesting from, from this model is actually that it improved the challenging scenarios. So on the right, we have a plot that showcase a, that diagnoses the data set and the harder cases for the baseline and for our, for our approach. So basically we have two plots. We have one of them that diagnoses the performance a different number of phase at any given frame. And then we also have a diagnosis that a, measure the performance at different, at different size of phase or of phases. So what we see here is actually that when we uh, use context, that's basically all the bars in green, uh, we achieve like a very huge improvement in the challenging cases when we have more phases and when we have small phases as well. And uh, okay, so now that we have diagnosed that, how well it performs uh, compared to the state of the art. So it actually improved the state of the art by 2% and without using any bells and whistles. This is the interesting part because all these approaches were participating in the AVA Active Speaker Challenge last year and they were using ensemble approaches and other post-processing techniques to improve the performance. Ours didn't use any bells and whistles for getting the result. And I'm gonna show just a qualitative result of how the active speaker uh, detector works in a sequence. So we see that in green, it actually is detecting the moments when that person is talking. This is a little bit a challenging scenario when we have many phases and we see that it gets a little bit confused. It's harder because you have a lot of noise between phases and so on, but it still do a good job on detecting the active speaker most of the time. All right, so now we have a technology to detect who is speaking at any given time, but can we go further? Can we identify who the speaker is and when that person talks? So that takes us to our uh, second project that is called uh, Audio Audiovisual Person Search, in short for APES. Um, basically the task here is actually given a query, a query image or audio cue. You wanna find when that person appears on the video, when that person is seen in the video, and when that person is seen and heard in the video as well, when that person is talking in the video. So one of the challenges that we have to face before moving forward in this direction is actually to develop and create a new data set because when we went to the literature, literature review, we found that there are uh, several data sets for this task, but they tend to be small and they're coming from uh, private movies that we cannot access, so we decided to actually create a new data set that is uh, readily accessible and that all researchers can use. So that takes us to the APES dataset, which is the main contribution of this work. It actually extends the AVA uh, active speaker dataset, but now it associates all the face tracks available in the dataset with face identities and voice identities as well. So we have collected more than 2,000 identities in the new dataset, and uh, the, the dataset has labeled more than 3 million faces and 30K tracking. As well, it introduced new a new modality into the community that is actually 26K uh, annotated voice segment. So in the bottom of the slide, we see the distribution of the data set. Um, I'm just gonna quickly mention that the data set follows an on the while distribution, a long tail on the while distribution, which is basically the main message I wanna uh, leave here. And on the further right of the bottom row, Actually, we see uh, the demographics of the identities we have labeled in the dataset. So we characterize the gender, 
the age and as well the race of the people that we have annotated. We notice that there is a certain imbalance in the data set and we're working to make it balanced. We think it's truly important to actually represent all these demographic categories uh, fairly in the data set we construct. And um, finally, which tasks are we, are we benchmarking? So actually we want to retrieve people we haven't seen in training. So we have this annotated data set. What we did is we split it into a training and validation set. And the training set, basically the people we use for training in the validation set, they don't appear at the validation and testing time. So basically that encourages us to, to develop a embeddings that actually learn the identities in an agnostic manner. So this is a huge table. Um, before I move into explaining each of the numbers, I'm gonna explain each one of the baselines that we have in there. So we have a FaceNet uh, baseline that actually uh, is basically an image pre-trained model that doesn't use any video for, for, for learning. Um, this is just applied into, into validation time and see how, um, and then we measure how well the retrieval is. Then we have the APES self-supervised method. So what is the self-supervised method here? Basically, uh, we didn't use any of the annotations that we have. We just use the source of videos and we use the available tracklets. So, so basically to learn this, uh, so to learn this embedding, uh, we did it in a triplet loss manner and to define the positive anchors, we just sample frames from the same tracklet and we assign those the same identities for, for, for the query anchor. And for Ape supervised, Ape supervised basically we did, uh, we trained the same model, but now using the training information. So we are not only using information from a single tracklet to define the positive triplets, uh, but now we're using information across different tracklets in different videos and different movies as well. So first thing that we see is actually that training on video helps. So that's what we see on the highlighted column on the left, the mean AP. So it actually provides a, an improvement on, of 10% uh, mean AP. Uh, that's the first uh, conclusion that we can reach after training the app supervised model. Uh, another thing that we found when we see the top right column, uh, the highlighted top right column is that we also see an improvement when we introduce audio cues for retrieving people, which is actually something that we want to uh, provide to the community as a takeaway message that for actually retrieving people, audio information can be extremely helpful. And finally, so we didn't uh, do any fancy self-supervision approach. We only leverage tracklet information, but we think there are a lot of opportunities to improve this performance in the future with by leveraging other structures in these videos. And this is some of the qualitative results that we have. So in here, basically, we have a query of a person, and then we have all the retrieved nearest neighbors. So I'm just going to play those. And what is interesting here is actually can retrieve uh, the correct identities uh, across many challenging scenarios when you have different point of views, different clothing, and as well, different illumination in those scenes. So what's the, what's next? So, uh, with that, I conclude the part of actually retrieving people in videos, but I just want to uh, leave a takeaway message. So once we're able to uh, build this speaker theorization technology and understand dialogue and conversations in scenes, we need to move forward into storytelling. Uh, many times we are using YouTube videos and social media videos for creating our machine learning models for action recognition, different tasks, but there is certain bias in those videos that we are not uh, encoding in any way. So many people, when they post those videos online, they actually have something in mind. They want to reach a more audience uh, to those videos. They want to incorporate their, their story to those videos. So there is a bias in, in, in those videos. So we really need methods that are somehow story aware and can understand what is the purpose and intention of the person uploading those videos. As well, once we have technology that understand dialogue and conversations, we can start deconstructing a storytelling. So we have many, many, many movies available uh, throughout the history. So can we create machines that somehow can resemble uh, our artists and can create engaging stories uh, as a final product? 
So with that, I would like to conclude. Uh, I would like to invite you all to the poster session that we have for the active speaker detection model. And it's gonna be on June 18 at 3 p.m. PDT. Uh, I just uh, leave you a link there that you can access. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fabian, thank you. Very interesting work. Um, we have some time for a couple of questions. Uh, I'll dive into it quickly. Uh, all right, Walid asks, uh, can the network handle any number of speakers? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we have a diagnosis in the paper, and we noticed that when we have multiple speakers in the scene, uh, actually the active speaker detection performance degrade. Uh, so yeah, that's a still a limitation we need to address. And that's from the how many phases do we have in the scene. But there is also another limitation is that when we have multiple people speaking at the same time. So this is one of the hardest scenarios because because actually, I mean, like the model is actually somehow leveraging some structure in the videos. We know that in conversations, one person tends to speak at a time. So the length, the, the, the model is actually leveraging that information. So in the future, I think it could be really important on how to prevent, a, you know, these shortcuts that the network is learning. So, so yeah, this is a very good question. So I think we need to investigate further that direction. Um, another question from Arka. Uh, they ask, is there any data set bias in active speaker, in AVA active speaker, uh, where the active speaker is usually closer to the camera? Yeah, that's a very good question. And we do have, unfortunately, the paper is still under review, but we have an analysis on that on the new AVA's data set that we built. But of course, there is certain bias to close ups because those are movies. But we see that it actually follows a long tail distribution. So we have many, many, many scenes that are actually close up, but we still have medium shots and long shots in those scenes. But I think that's the nature that we will see at least in many, many of the videos that we're uploading to, to our websites. Um, and yeah, I mean, it will be great to, to handle these long tail scenarios, but I think that's a general issue uh, that we're facing in computer vision in general. Awesome. Uh, one more question from Yeping. They ask if the speech uh, is out of screen and there are two persons in the screen, whether the model still finds the face in the video or it will know that there is no active speaker. So can you repeat it again? It was a little so, bit. Uh, the, yeah. Basically the question is if there is a speech out of the screen and you have uh, faces in the, uh, in the shot, mm -hmm. would your model still find the face from the video or will accurately know that there is no active speaker? Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, actually with the data we do have right now, we cannot truly really evaluate that, but we have done some qualitative analysis on that and actually performs really well. Uh, in the cases when the person actually have the lips closed. So when you have a person actually laughing and, you know, when they have like strong mouth expressions, or as strong facial expressions with mouths open, we see that actually off screen speech can confuse the model. So this is also another interesting direction to, to handle. I mean, how to model those cases when we have facial expressions that involve like mouth open, uh, facial expression, so very good question as well. Awesome. Uh, one question from Juan Carlos. Um, do you also have act orientations? Uh, this is, I think, for the APES data set. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if this could be used for actor identification if there are enough sequences that contain the same actor. Yeah, so we didn't identify the, you know, the name of that person. What we did is like we have a set of track, a set of track, a set of face tracks in the data set, and we just link all these face track by face identity. So we don't know who they are, but we know that X tracklets belong to, or the X tracklets belong to person A. So it definitely can allow this, this set of baselines, but we wanted to really focus on this retrieval approach where we actually don't know, uh, don't have previous information about an actor. We just wanted to do it on the wild. So we want to focus more on this low shot 
a actor detection rather than actually building a, an actor recognition system. Awesome. Uh, I guess we have one more question. Time for one more question. Gordon asks, can the gestures, hands, etc., uh, help improve the speaker recognition accuracy on top of the face and the voice? Mm -hmm. that, that's a very good point. So I think we did a small experiment, but we didn't reach any conclusive uh, result in there. But I remember I attended uh, a work in last ICCB where they actually, uh, you know, encode a you know, hand gestures. So we know that certain like cultures tend to be more expressive in the way they talk. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's further exploration that, that we need to address. So we are only actually in this work, we focus only on faces, but actually a model in the whole human body can help to identify the active speaker. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Fabian.